Today we're continuing to think about total fitness and in particular emotional fitness and we're going to focus on the role of painful feelings, emotions that aren't very pleasant and the role of those in being emotionally fit. Professor Craig Keener uh, tells a story of a young man whom he knew who was going to seminary, training to become a pastor. And one day this seminarian got into an argument in class with his professor. And the two of them became very heated in their argument over a Bible verse. And they were both pretty upset with each other. And then the class was over and the student uh, went back and went about various activities and throughout the day he still felt kind of rotten and in fact he felt threatened. And he got to thinking about why do I feel so threatened? He had a sense that he had to go and apologize to the professor but also he was kind of curious why he was feeling so strongly about all of this. And then during a time of prayer and as he was being kind of carried deeper into prayer and praying with his spirit, he began to realize um, why he felt so threatened. He thought back to his father. And his father was somebody that he really had never been able to talk to much. And when he did talk to him, everything that he said, no matter how well-reasoned his father, would just scoff at him. And he realized as he kept on thinking and praying that he hated his father. And as he prayed a little longer, he realized, well, I also love my father. So anyway, after his time of prayer, the next day he went to his professor and apologized to him for that big argument they had in class. And the professor apologized to him as well and said, well, we'll be better friends for it. But there still was the matter of his father. So he, after a while, um, and after classes were done for the year, took a trip that summer to go back and to see his family. And one day when other family members were out of the house and he was alone in the house with his dad, his dad was reading the newspaper, he went to him and said, uh, Dad, can we talk? Sure, son, he said, with the newspaper still in front of his face. And the son said, um, Dad, you know, I'm not saying this was your doing or your fault, but when I was growing up, I felt like I could never talk to you. And I realized that that made me very angry. And in fact, Dad, I hated you. But... Now, you know, I'm really sorry about that, and I also want you to know that I love you. And the newspaper never stirred from in front of the father's face. He said, that's okay, son. That's how all boys feel about their dad. And that was the end of that conversation. But the young man had done what he knew he was supposed to do. A while later, his mother said to him, what did you talk to your father about? He seems to be different. He's spending time with your brother, you know, the younger brother who was still living at home, and he's talking with him a lot and spending a lot of time with him. And so the young man told his mom what they had spoken about, and his mom said, well, that is how he felt about his father, and they never made up before he died. And since that time, the young man, the seminarian, and his father had a, a good relationship in which um, they were able to express their, their love to each other. But it didn't come very easily, and it didn't come without some really rotten feelings being felt and then expressed. Painful feelings are painful. I, by definition, they're unpleasant. But they are often helpful as well if we pay real attention to them. In talking about um, emotional fitness in a previous message, we saw that your emotions are really fit or healthy if they're in tune with reality, if they're in tune 
with what's going on in relation to other people and in tune with God. And that does not mean that they're always cheery and happy all the day because reality isn't always a fabulous thing to experience. And your relationships aren't always uh, in great shape. And, and God, your, your perceptions of God aren't always just the cheery things, but the more painful feelings may show something as well. Emotions are fit when they're being displayed appropriately and when you're not just very reactive or always gushing what's inside of you and on the other hand always keeping everything bottled up but when they're being expressed appropriately. Uh, when they're linked with other parts of total fitness because there's more to life than emotions but not less. They're fit, they're healthy when they're helping you to sense really true and deep realities. Your logic and your memory of facts are not the only way of knowing things. Emotions are part of your equipment for really knowing, for experiencing, for encountering reality. And when they're fit, you're going to have a better sense of reality. When they're messed up, you're going to have a really skewed idea of reality. So emotions are really valuable to help you get and sometimes sense some of the deepest and most important things about reality, including what the condition of your heart is and what God's heart is like. And we're going to look at uh, the painful emotions, some of them today, but I've, I've already said that painful emotions can sometimes be healthy and accurate, and, and yet the pain should not be triggered too easily and should not last forever or overwhelm or shape your complete identity. The pain is to be limited. The pleasure of God's goodness to you and of experiencing Him should always be the predominant note and the one that lasts into eternity long after the painful ones are gone and the tears are wiped away. So today uh, we're going to be exploring emotions and in particular the painful feelings that we have and next time we'll think more about the pleasant feelings and those those feelings and their role in living a healthy and, and uh, positive life before the Lord. As we look at painful feelings, let's look at a passage of the Bible, Psalm 69, in which the psalmist pours out a lot of pain. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden from you. May those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me, O Lord, the Lord Almighty. May those who seek you not be put to shame because of me, O God of Israel. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. But I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor. In your great love, O God, answer me in your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Redeem me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. I am in pain and distress. May your salvation, O God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. The poor will see and be glad. 
You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. That psalm is one among many that are labeled by scholars as psalms of disorientation. There are some psalms which are praising God and everything seems great. There are others of reorientation where it kind of starts out grim and, and then gets really cheery. And there are ones that are just very disoriented for most of the psalm where you're really out of sorts and where various emotions are poured out. Um, in this one, fear sadness, guilt, he knows he's guilty before God of some things, shame at all that's being poured out on him, anger, hate, it's all there. And you see that in the Psalms, if you read in some of the prophets, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, other prophets, they are weeping prophets uh, much of the time. They're complaining prophets about things that are going on. And so if we were simply to take the route of saying, well, the Bible says to rejoice in the Lord always, um, we would have to eliminate a lot of the Bible if we thought that was the only word that the Bible spoke, because even in the midst of rejoicing, there will be tears. So let's look today at uh, these painful feelings. There are others as well, but these are, are a good sample of what we can discover and learn from painful feelings. Fear and sadness. Fear has to do with, what, with bad things that look like they might happen or are likely to happen. Sadness is pain over bad things that have already happened. And the Bible is full of expressions of pain and sadness. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. That's actually healthy fear and sadness because things are messed up. The city is rotting. Destructive forces are at work and they're scary forces. They're already doing bad things. And we ought to be sad when communities are in shambles, when terrible powers are at work. There is something wrong with your emotions if you can just skate along with a plastic smile on your face when people all around you are suffering, when the society that you're part of is in trouble. You're emotionally fit when you're feeling something of the pain that threatens others, even if it isn't an immediate threat to you. And even more so, if it is an immediate threat to you, there's a, a part of you that ought to be just a little bit scared because it shows you're aware of what's really going on instead of always pretending to yourself. There are misguided types of fear and sadness. I'll highlight a few verses about that. The wicked man flees though no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. That's one of the Proverbs. Some people are just fraidy cats. And sometimes the wicked are fraidy cats because they're just given to fear. And that's part of God's judgment on them for rejecting him is sometimes they get panicky and scared and worried when really there's not even any danger to them except what's in their own minds. Fear of man. That's a kind of fear. At one level, yeah, you're going to be scared of other people who can do bad stuff to you. But at another level, fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. So you can be scared so much of what other people think of you that it's a wrong kind of fear. It's, it's warping your emotions when, when God is on your side, when you've got positive relationships with some people, and yet you're so worried about this or that person whose opinion of you, whose power over you is really not all that big a deal. And you can just have misguided sadness over something you shouldn't even be sad about. An example from the Bible is Ahab. Ahab had a bad day. Boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo. poor me. Oh, woe is me. I've got it so rough. Man, do I feel bad. Poor little Ahab. And Ahab is the king of Israel who is fabulously wealthy. 
But there's one vineyard out there that somebody doesn't want to sell him because it's the inheritance of his fathers for generations. So he doesn't want to sell his vineyard to Ahab. Oh, what a way to wreck your day. Oh, how horrible to be cast into such depression when all you own is merely a kingdom and somebody else happens to have one vineyard that you can't grab when you want it. But you can, as his wife Jezebel reminds him. So they just murder Naboth and grab his vineyard. So there is such a thing as misguided sadness. When you're a selfish pig, when you're greedy for something, and, oh, sorry, you didn't get it. And your very sadness can drive you to just get what you want. So that's a, a really misguided kind of emotion. That's when you're not emotionally fit, when you're sad, when you have nothing to be sad about. There is, however, healthy fear and sadness. The Bible says, do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. You ought to be scared of God. That's what that verse is saying. If you want to be scared of anybody, you be scared of the one who holds all power over life and death, who holds complete control over your future. If you're at odds with him, you ought to be shaken in your boots. And if you've got problems with anybody else, well, you can be a little bit scared or nervous about this or that, but they really don't have the kind of power over you that you're granting them. So learn to have a healthy fear of the Lord and all your other fears are going to shrink back down to the proper size. Sometimes we need to learn to be sad. The, pro, the Apostle James says, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. He says, these are people who've been bickering with each other. They've been asking God sometimes for things, but they're not getting them because they ask with wrong desires just to spend on their own pleasures. And they're in love with the world. And really, they don't love God. And so James says, Healthy emotion for them would be to grieve, mourn, and wail, to quit their laughing and to start crying, to quit rejoicing and to sink into gloom because they're in a bad way. So that would actually be healthy fear and healthy sadness when you're rebelling against God or when you're on the wrong track. Then your emotions are really in tune with reality when you start to cry. When we think about fear and sadness, these experiences, these feelings are not foreign to the Lord Jesus. During his life on earth, we read that uh, when his friend died, Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, perhaps at the power of death, but also at the unbelief of many of the people who were there. And Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Then before Jesus faced his own suffering and death, he said, Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. So he determines to go through with it, but that doesn't change the fact that his heart is troubled, that he dreads what's about to happen, and he is overwhelmed with sadness over it. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And this was the man of all men, the one whose life was perfect the ideal human, and he could feel intense fear and sadness. So it's very clear, first, that fear and sadness are not always evil or sinful, that sometimes they're appropriate, and that also, when you feel them, you're not alone. That our Lord has been there and felt that. And when we have fear and sadness, of course, one of the central things that we need to do is put our faith in that Jesus who knows our, our sorrows, but also in his great Father who delivers us from them. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Record my lament, list my tears on your scroll. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. So when you're afraid, you go to God and then you say, and now from this point on, the, the fear is going to start going down. There's also the promise of God that fear and sadness, though they may have their season, come to an end. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. That's what the Bible says about fear and sadness. And remember that it says all these things. So don't try to jump too quickly to 
the gladness and joy in a sense because sometimes you need to go through a season of healthy fear and sadness. But if you're like Ahab and you're just pouting, it's time to get out of that season real quick and get your head on straight and get your heart in the right position. Um, and to realize that Jesus is there with us and that God promises to deliver us from these things as well. Another pair of emotions are guilt and shame. Very, very unpleasant emotions to feel guilty, to feel that you have done wrong, and to feel embarrassed or ashamed, to feel that you're kind of contemptible that others are looking down on you and you kind of deserve maybe to be looked down upon, to just be ashamed of what you've done or worse yet, ashamed of who you are. And there's a time when that's a healthy feeling because you are guilty and you ought to be ashamed. You read the prophet Jeremiah, the, there's a healthy prayer, let us lie down in our shame and let our disgrace cover us. We have sinned against the Lord our God. And there's something very unhealthy if you never feel guilty, if you never feel embarrassed or ashamed. Twice the prophet speaks of people who simply have no shame. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. And these are the kind of people whom Jeremiah describes as saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, who are feeling that all is well, but it's not. And it's not that they're so good that they have nothing to be embarrassed about. It's that they're so shameless, so hardened, that no matter what they do, they would rather celebrate it and brag about it and parade about it and whatever, boast about it, than change their ways. And that's, that's a way of dealing with guilt and shame. When, when you do something shameful, there are a few different options. One is to feel really bad about it and seek to change. And the other is to say, well, I kind of think I want to keep doing this, and I want to get used to it. And I want those feelings not to hurt so much anymore. And you don't even think those thoughts to yourself, but you just, you plunge further in. And the further you plunge, the less the shame afflicts you. And you say, hey, it's working. I don't feel as guilty as I used to. I don't feel as embarrassed as I once did. Man, was I a dunce back when I was younger. You know, I, I'd get all upset about those things. They'd trouble me, and, and now I've seen the light. Isn't it great to be liberated? Well, you may have been liberated from having healthy emotions. You may have been liberated from a healthy sense of shame. David committed a great crime. He committed adultery with another man's wife, and then he had her husband murdered. And he hadn't completely lost his sense of right and wrong. Because when someone came to him and told him a story, he immediately reacted in the right way. Prophet Nathan came to him and told him a story about a man who had one little pet lamb. And that little pet lamb was so cute, and he and his family loved it. They would feed it, and they would hug it and take it to bed with them. And he had a rich neighbor who had a whole huge flock of sheep, but he had a guest come by. And when the guest came by, he came and stole the poor man's one little lamb and slaughtered it. David said, that man deserves to die. Nathan said, you, you're the man. Ooh. Then David prayed this prayer because he knew Nathan was right. He said, against you, God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Save me from blood guilt, O God. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Was David's emotional life healthier when he simply got his way, got the woman, got her husband Uriah knocked off and dead and everything could proceed and he could just go on with business as usual? Or was he in better shape when he was absolutely heartbroken after God's prophet showed him exactly the kind of man he had behaved as? Well, there is such a thing as healthy guilt and shame. And David's story shows us how challenging that is for each of us. Because when, when we have a conscience that can still feel guilty, and we have a sense of what's embarrassing, 
We can still look at other people and say, that is bad. He ought to be ashamed of himself. And it is sometimes harder to look in the mirror and say, boy, what I did was bad. And I ought to be ashamed of myself. So there is a place for healthy guilt and shame in our lives. But there's also shame that's misplaced, a wrong sense of shame. Job was a man who suffered greatly, and it was very embarrassing for him to be the richest and most important man in the East, and all of a sudden have nothing, and be on an ash heap, and have his wife criticizing him, his children dead, his friends assuming he must have done something bad to bring all this on him, and he's sitting there, he says, even if I'm innocent, I can't lift my head, for I'm full of shame, I'm drowned in my affliction. Psalm 4, the psalmist says, how long, O oh men, will you turn my glory into shame? He's praising God. He's a man who's walking with the Lord, but other people mock him. And they think that's just stupid. And you might live in a situation where people say, ah, you know, people who are religious, they, they just have kind of a low IQ. They're gullible. They're easily taken in. We who know stuff are smarter. We're better. We happen to be better looking too, but we won't get into that. And, you, know, so you, you get kind of this sense that you're just being mocked and despised, but the shame you feel isn't really well-placed shame because you've got nothing to be ashamed about. Psalm 69, which we read earlier, I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. And misplaced shame can come when other people are mocking you or have shown contempt for you. And some of the deepest wrongly placed shame comes when you were treated in a way as a child that was shameful. And you were told it was all your fault. And you were told that you were a filthy person. This, this happens in maybe a, to the worst degree with children who are sexually molested as little ones. And the adult who does it to them tells them that they had it coming. Um, they wanted that. Uh, they are something dirty and shameful. And they have something inside Sometimes for many years afterward that says, that's true. I'm ashamed. I'm a guilty person. I've known people who went that, through that who thought they had committed the unpardonable sin. <laughs> they didn't even know what the unpardonable sin is in the scriptures, but they were sure they had committed it. And it, tra it traced back to what happened to them when they were little kids. So you can have just this terrible sense of shame and guilt where you feel God is against you, where you're bad, 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 and you're not. But it's the accuser, the accuser Satan and those who are doing Satan's dirty work who accuse you and you're wrongly shamed. And so part of sorting through our painful feelings and getting healthier emotions is to realize when certain kinds of accusations that we feel are from the evil one and not from the Lord. And learning to believe what God says to us rather than what God's enemies say to us or how they mock us. God himself knows what it's like to be in a difficult position, even to be embarrassed. It was embarrassing for God to have chosen Israel. When God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel, he says, you really put me in a tough position. I chose you, I brought you into my land, which is supposed to be a holy land, and you have made it filthy. And my name is connected with all that stuff you're doing. And so I kicked you out of my holy land. And that was embarrassing for me too. Because then the other nation said, boy, what a wimpy God they have. He couldn't even protect them from their enemies and keep them in their own territory. So now what am I supposed to do? You embarrass me when you're in my land, and you embarrass me when I kick you out of my land. God says, they profaned my holy name. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, O house of Israel. And as is God's way, when he's between a rock and a hard place, he just moves the rock and the hard place. He says, okay. You're a mess. You've embarrassed me. No matter what I do, you have embarrassed me. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take out of you that heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh. And I'm going to make you people who don't embarrass me anymore. 
I'm going to turn you into people who have me living in you. And you're going to be a different kind of person. And when that happens, then God's not going to have much to be ashamed of anymore in the people that he has chosen. So it is a remarkable thing when you read the Bible that even God can feel a sense of embarrassment over the people he has chosen. And God, in the person of his son, takes all the shame, all the embarrassment that God feels uh, over us on himself, but also all of the shame that godly people have felt throughout history. Even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, and it was written in the passage we read earlier, Psalm 69, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Jesus was counted among those who were sinners. He bore the sins of many and interceded for sinners. When you feel guilt and shame, you're feeling something that Christ himself had put upon him. Our guilt, our shame. And when Jesus was arrested, the religious authorities who were checking him and accusing him found him guilty. They accused him of blasphemy, the worst offense against God. And then they spit on him, and they punched him. Now, being spit upon has only one purpose, to show contempt, to embarrass and shame you. And when those religious authorities got done, then he was handed over to the political authorities and to their soldiers. And what did they do? They spit on him and put a crown of thorns on his head and mocked his claim to be a king. Then when they nailed him to the cross, he was stripped of his clothing, stripped of his dignity. The people who walked by were mocking and laughing at him. The leaders were mocking and saying, ha, if you're the Christ, why don't you just come down from the cross and save yourself? Nah, he saved others and he can't even save himself. What a joke. And to be mocked and scorned and shamed is one of the most miserable experiences of life. And of course, um, to be physically tortured is not a lot of fun either. But we're talking now not about the physical tortures Jesus endured, but the mockery, the insults, and the weight of guilt that he bore when he bore the sins of the world, when God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And when we think of Jesus' guilt and shame, then the Bible invites us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. No matter how much, throne, no matter how much shame was thrust upon him, Jesus despised that shame because he knew why he was there, he knew his purpose from God, and he had joy set before him, the joy of God's promised resurrection and the joy of saving everybody from guilt and shame who put their trust in him. So guilt and shame are emotions that, that are built into us by God that have their place. And so we, we need to have a sense of what's wrong and what's shameful. We need to have a sense of Jesus identifying with us and we also need to have a sense of when that shame is misplaced, when we don't deserve to feel guilty, we don't deserve to feel ashamed. It's the work of the evil one, bringing on a shame that we're not at fault for. Anger and hate, sometimes it's misguided. Proverbs says a lot of bad things about anger, and I'm not going to quote them all, I'll just quote one. An angry man stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. Your anger is bad if you're going around causing anger in other people and if you're really quick to get angry. If every little thing sets you off, there's something wrong with your anger. The Bible speaks of people who were angry and hateful and, and sometimes it was misplaced. Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Why was that? Well, because the Lord found his brother's offering acceptable and pleasing, but not Cain's. And so Cain was mad. And God said, look out, Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. And Cain went out and murdered his brother because he was mad. He was mad. He was not in tune with his brother. He was not in tune with God. And that meant, of course, that it was their fault. 
And so the brother had to die so that Cain could be right. Or back to our good buddy Ahab, the one who sulked when he couldn't get one vineyard when he already had a whole kingdom. There were various um, religious people around, and Ahab was a religious man. And he liked a lot of religious people and a lot of religious leaders. There was one guy, actually more than one, but a couple he couldn't stand. He didn't like Elijah the prophet because whenever Elijah would come, he'd say, oh, you found me, oh, my enemy. And Elijah says, yeah, I found you. And Ahab, another conversation, says, is that you, Elijah, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, you're the troubler of Israel. So he didn't get along great with Elijah because Elijah was a real prophet of God, not one of the hundreds of paid religious leaders that Ahab happened to like. There was another guy, Micaiah. And when Ahab was meeting with um, King Jehoshaphat of the land of Judah, they were going to get into an alliance and go to a battle. And King Jehoshaphat was a godly man. He, wanted to, he heard all of Ahab's hired prophets say good things and say, go forth and conquer. The battle's going to go great. And something about that didn't, right, they didn't ring quite right to Jehoshaphat. So he said, is, is there a real prophet of God around here? Um, could you ask him? And Ahab says, yeah, well, there is one in the neighborhood, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad. Well, yeah. <laughs> he just hates Micaiah the prophet because Micaiah has nothing good to say about him. Well, sometimes if a true prophet of God isn't saying rosy things about you, You've got to examine whether there's something wrong with the prophet or something wrong with you. And sure enough, Ahab brings in Micaiah. And this time Micaiah sings in the nice song. He says, go and conquer. Everything's going to go great. Ahab says, oh, come on. You never say anything like that to me. <laughs> so Micaiah gives him the straight news. Okay, I saw Israel scattered as sheep without a shepherd. The council of heaven has determined that you're heading into that battle and you're not coming out of it alive. Ah, didn't I tell you he never says anything good? That was, that's Ahab, okay? So there is such a thing as misguided anger and hate. And, and when you look at your own emotional life, what are the things that make you mad? Or the things that really get you going against somebody else? Is it because they... Are such bad people doing such bad things to you? Or is it just because they happen to interfere with your sense of how things ought to go and your sense of always needing to be right? Well, we might also be tempted to say, you know, anger and hate, those are bad, bad emotions. We've seen already in the Bible now how anger can be so bad and hateful, hate can be so misguided. But then we see other passages of the Bible where it seems like God gets angry and God hates who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. The Lord hates the wicked. The Lord hates the one who loves violence. The Lord hates people with twisted hearts. The Lord hates those who don't keep their word. And a couple of those, it is, just trans it is hate, and a couple of those, it may also be translated, they're an abomination to the Lord. You say, well, that's a big improvement on Hate, uh, well, no, not really. You know, when you're an abomination to somebody, they think you stink. They can't stand having you around. They're against you. So however you want to translate that, God has some people that he is really, really against and that he's really, really angry with. And the Bible teaches that if God's wrath is not taken away, then we perish under God's wrath forever. So to think that anger and hatred have zero place in the Christian's life might be a mistake if the God we trust in expresses his anger and hatred. There is such a thing as healthy anger and hate. The Bible, sometimes it's hard to know where it's healthy and where it's just an outpouring of the person in prayer when you're reading those Psalms, but it says the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Love, now we get to the New Testament and love. Love must be sincere. And the very next words are, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. If you have a healthy emotional life, you're going to have healthy hatred for the things that are wrong. And in a sense, even healthy hatred for those who are perpetrating those wrongs. 
Now in the New Testament and even in the Old, we hear that we are to love our enemies. So we're to love those even where there's a hateful relationship existing. There's another sense in which we may love them. And the New Testament tells us now, don't take vengeance on people and don't pour out your hatred on them. Leave room for God's vengeance. God says, I'll avenge, I'll repay, I'll take care of it. Because it, the Bible, God knows how easy it is for us to get wrapped up in anger and hatred in the wrong way and to seek vengeance that is not really warranted at all and goes way beyond all justice. So God says, you leave payback to me, I'll take care of it. But he doesn't say that you should never feel angry about anything or never feel intense opposition and hatred towards anything. When there is somebody in your life who infuriates you and you believe you have the right to be furious, and you actually do, somebody, for lack of a better word, whom you hate. I mentioned a young man earlier who hated his father and loved him. There are some people like that where we may hate them and love them. Well, what do you do? The Bible says to pray for those who persecute you. Jesus says, love your enemies. So when you, what do you pray for? The way you say, I'll pray for those who persecute me. I'm going to haul out a couple of those Old Testament Psalms and I'll pray for them all right. Lord, may you smash their teeth. May they go down to the pit. May you never save them. May they be obliterated. <laughs> well, I prayed for them all right. And that prayer is not entirely wrong. I mean, it was a prayer of godly people in the Old Testament, but I don't think it's what Jesus meant when he said, pray for your enemies. But I do believe that that can be your backup prayer. That can be your plan B prayer. Because in the New Testament, you know, Jesus prayed for, his, her, for those who crucified him. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Stephen, the first martyr, prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin to their charge while they were pelting him with rocks. And the person who was leading the killing of Stephen was saved by God and became the great apostle Paul. So these prayers for your enemies don't say, well, that's just kind of a nice, pious little thing to do. God might answer that prayer. And he did. He got rid of his enemy. He obliterated that vicious man, Saul. But he didn't obliterate him by sending him to hell. He wiped him out by just destroying the old man and making a new one out of him. So when you pray for your enemies, I think it's very safe to pray, Lord, destroy that person. Destroy them. Wipe them out. But destroy them by saving them. That would be the best thing, is to have them crucified with Christ and then have them raised again to new life by the Holy Spirit. And if they're not going to be born again, then break their power. Don't let them keep doing that. You, you know, if you know of somebody who's doing criminal stuff or somebody who's an abuser, do you want them to keep doing that? No. You want it stopped. So Lord, bring them down. Either save them or bring them down. And there's a healthy hate and an anger that seeks the destruction of the sinful dominance of some people. The Bible also has us just feeling out of sorts with God, sad at what God's been up to and mad at him. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep. All this happened to us, though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. But you crushed us and covered us over with deep darkness. Awake, O Lord! Why do you sleep? That's not the calm deliberation of somebody who's analyzing things. This is somebody who is really sad that God has not come through and mad that God still isn't coming through and pretty sure that we don't deserve this. We didn't break your covenant. Sometimes we know God punishes those who break his covenant, but sometimes stuff happens and it's not what you did. Why are you taking such a long nap, God? Please get with it and wake up. You might say, well, that's another one of those Old Testament prayers that we ought to improve a little bit as we hit the New Testament. But Jesus tells the story of an unjust judge who won't give people justice. And a widow comes to him and keeps bugging him and bugging him and bugging him till finally he just wants to get rid of her bothering him and so he gives her justice. He says, now, um, you should pray to God. But he tells the story of an unjust judge, and sometimes God seems like an unjust judge. And we feel sad about it, we feel mad at him, and we just want him to do what he's supposed to do. And Jesus, in his story, doesn't say, well, God really is unjust. But he says, now, if that's what an unjust judge would do if you kept bugging him, let's get back to some faith here. 
that your Father in heaven is going to judge and give justice, and he'll do it speedily. But it's okay if you're in that season where things are messed up and you can't see God's hand to pour out your heart to him. I'm not sure how okay it is, to be honest. I know it's better than to pretend you're not sad or to pretend you're not mad at him because he already knows. So when you pray to him, you could take a clue from the Psalms and just pour out your heart and say, Lord, you sort out the mess. Some of this may well be sinful. My anger at my enemies, maybe it's wrong. My anger at you, maybe it's wrong. Uh, maybe it's just the natural, uh, you know, or even a right way to feel in some ways towards such enemies. But whatever it is, it's how I feel. So here it is. Sort it out. Anything that's wrong, um, just help me with it. Even where Psalm 139, don't I hate those who hate you? I hate them with perfect hatred. The very next words are, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When you pray a prayer like that, I hate their guts. I hate them as much as you hate them. I hate them with a perfect hatred. You might want to say that next prayer as well. Now, Lord, search me here. Um, not sure I'm all right about that. In your anger, do not sin. When you're on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. New Testament quotes that in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not let give the devil a foothold. You can get angry about something or somebody, but do not become an angry person where anger defines you, where that boiling rage in you just dictates who you are and what you do. Don't let the sun go down on your anger because the longer it festers, the less it's an emotion and the more it becomes you. Because you're giving the devil a foothold. And if you give him a foothold and don't deal with it, that foothold becomes a stronghold of bitterness and rage. And after a while, you become more and more like that angry devil. And so, Lord, search me. Um, anger and hatred, there may be a place for it, but it's a limited place. And when you have it, give it to God. So as we've said before, Emotions, one of the roles is just to give you heart knowledge, knowledge of your own heart, of what you're doing with reality, what your heart's doing with other people around you, how you're reacting to God. If you pay attention to your emotions instead of just kind of skating along and pretending they're not there, you'll get a better sense of what's really going on inside your own heart. And we've also seen it can give you hints of God's heart, at God's feelings, of, of how He enters into our pain and our sadness and our shame and our guilt and our anger and our hatred and things we can reveal about his character by allowing our emotions to tell us a little something about his emotions. Emotional fitness helps us to feel deep realities and included in those realities are what the painful emotions show us. Life is worse than I dare to admit. I'm worse than I dare to admit. God is harsher than I dare to fear. Those are realities that if we just kind of leave those painful emotions alone and look at some nice, um, clean, well-clipped doctrines. We never have to feel the reality of those things. And so we sometimes try to um, just skip them over. In emotional fitness, we're in tune with reality and others and God and, and all these other things I've mentioned, displaying them appropriately, um, linked with other parts of fitness, uh, sensing realities, including God's heart. Um, and so we need to explore our painful feelings instead of avoid them. So just a few questions to explore. What triggers you? What triggers you to feel afraid or sad or guilty or ashamed or angry or hateful? Because that's a measure of how, how healthy your emotions are. It's not whether you feel afraid or angry or hateful or whatever. It's what triggered you to feel that way. Is it something that was worth triggering you? like the collapse of society or the loss of a loved one. You know, these are, a, then to feel sad or distressed is appropriate. Or do you get sad when you already have a kingdom and somebody wants the vineyard next door as well? You know, what in your own life gets you ticked off? Just the things that uh, affect your own selfish me, myself, and I? Or the really serious things? And then how do your feelings affect your behavior? When you get mad, do you blow up right away? How do you express that? Um, when you're sad, 
do you dissolve into jelly instantly? Or are you able to still have the strength and steadiness to carry on when you're sad, when you're guilty and ashamed? Do you go to God with it? Um, or do you just plunge further into it to harden yourself to it? How do, how do your feelings affect your behavior? What are your feelings saying about reality, about others, about God? Because you can listen to the right doctrines, you can parrot the right words, what are your feelings saying about it? You may say, God is in control, God is good all the time. And secretly, if you were honest about your emotions, you'd say, wake up, oh God, why do you sleep? Why is my life so hard? Why is the world such a mess? You might be better off taking a, a brief break from God is good all the time and pay attention to what you're really feeling about them. What are they saying about reality and others and God? That doesn't mean you've got to be stuck being mad at God forever, but if you are mad at Him, just it'd be better if you knew it and faced it. What do your painful feelings point to in your heart and God's heart? What are you discovering about your heart? It's not always bad to discover bad things about your heart. It's good to discover bad things about your heart. It's a lot worse to have bad things floating around and not deal with them. And do your painful feelings outweigh the pleasant ones? Do you have a joy that's greater than the grief you feel? Do you have a peace that's greater than the fears that you feel? Again, just explore your painful feelings a bit. And then, um, if you find that you're kind of emotionally sick, there's a variety of things to consider. Seek and maintain total fitness. Um, and that means that you need to realize there may be other things that cause problems in your emotions besides your spiritual life. Let's be realistic about that because um, you got to deal with that. So it may be your body's got problems, okay? You don't have the right nutrition. There are illnesses in your body that are affecting your mind and your feelings, and that could be the case. And so you should check with a physician or a nutritionist just in case bodily problems are affecting your emotions. Don't go examining your heart for the most deep spiritual things if what you need is attention to your thyroid. Consult with a counselor or therapist, perhaps, to see if mental illness or deep wounds affect you. Because again, if you're tra chasing a spiritual cause for what is largely uh, due to something else, then you're just going to come up with the wrong answers. And so there may be times to find out if it's not uh, so much a spiritual problem, but uh, an emotional or psychological one from wounds that have deeply affected you. That's closely related to the spiritual, but it's not quite the same. And you should not feel like you're acting in unbelief if you go to a doctor for physical problems or if you go to a therapist for certain kinds of troubles. Because that's what they're there for, and God places various kinds of people in the world to help you. And if there are spiritual problems and you find yourself struggling or unable to deal with them, then ask a godly guide, whether it's a pastor or someone you respect of spiritual maturity, to explore with you whether that emotional pain you're going through might have some spiritual roots. So you want to, if your emotions are sick, to deal with those. And then to trust that's ultimately what it's about, is, is faith in the middle of all this. As I've just been saying, address any unhealthy pain that doesn't have spiritual roots or a spiritual cure. And then some do have a spiritual root, and here's just a few suggestions. One is pray the Psalms of disorientation. And here maybe I'll go a step further without knocking anything too hard, but don't only listen to Christian praise music all day, every day. Because the Psalms are not filled with praise music all day, every day. There are some fantastic psalms of praise, and there are some others. And you need to pray those, because when they put you in touch with other stuff that's going on inside of you, and you need to bring that stuff to God in prayer, and the psalms will do that. The psalms cover a wider range of emotions than the upbeat, I want to feel better for the next five minutes brand of music that some of us have. I'm not knocking, you know, there's a place for upbeat and happy music. If you try to live on it, it will make you somebody who is not in touch with what's going on really in the world or in yourself anymore. So pray the Psalms of disorientation. Fix your eyes on Jesus 
And not just the risen Jesus, but the Jesus who suffered for you, this, the Jesus who suffers with you, the Spirit groaning inside you when you don't know how you ought to pray. Trust in a God who suffers with you, who feels that pain. Embrace Jesus' cross and take up your cross and follow Him. And realize that when you follow Him, it's not always going to be easy. There will be painful feelings as you follow Him. And so you do it anyway, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising its shame. And then you count on the resurrection life of Jesus to make all things well in the end. Those are some of the ways that we can learn from our painful feelings and draw closer to our Savior and our God through those painful feelings. Dear Father, we pray that you'll help each of us to just be a little more honest with ourselves and to find out what's really going on inside ourselves. Where, Lord, we have painful feelings, we pray that you'll be the great healer, the one who uses those feelings to drive us to seek you, to find forgiveness for our guilt and shame that's rightly placed, to find from you deliverance from the fears and the sorrows that afflict us, to find in you also the one who is just and will give just vengeance at the proper time, but will also save many from their old ways. And so help us to just cast ourselves upon you, to pray to you honestly and with full faith, and to find in you our hope and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.